Um, next up, we've got Darren Cook from Northern Star Resources. Uh, so he'll be talking about the importance of technical geology in mining mergers and acquisitions uh, and some examples and lessons from the Northern Star growth story. So thank you so much, Darren, for joining. I'll try and... No problem, Jess. I'll just get this uh, set up. Okay. Uh, I'll just get this right. Uh, just checking, can everyone see that okay? Yep, that looks perfect. Fantastic. All right, first of all, um, just like to say um, congratulations to Mark and the, the Sky team. Um, I think the, the, the previous, um, you know, his presentation demonstrates the importance of good geology and uh, even though Australia is viewed as a fairly mature jurisdiction, there's still a place for good geology and uh, still the potential for major uh, discoveries to be made. So well done to Mark and the uh, Sky team and we look forward to um, following the story moving forward. Um, also, thanks to Jess for organising this um, and especially thanks to everyone for giving up your uh, Friday afternoon. I've got the, the graveyard shift, obviously, and it's uh, pretty much beer o'clock. Um, so I'll try not to make this uh, too painful for you or I'll just head back to the start of the presentation. All right. So the, uh, the, the topic today is the importance of um, you know, geology and the concept in um, mining and um, mergers and acquisitions. And Northern Star's been very active in um, the m and space in the last um, 10 years in particular. And we'll go through a bit of the Northern Star growth story uh, to demonstrate that. Um, and geology um, during the due diligence has played a key uh, role in, in the growth. And it's, it's often overlooked in a world that's dominated by uh, financial uh, metrics and, and terminology and, and people that aren't technically um, based. Um, the geology is the foundation of any good merger and acquisition. So I'll just talk about some of the things that we look at um, in terms of our due diligence process from a geology perspective. Um, give you some examples of some of our more recent um, acquisitions, um, but namely the, um, the, the Pogo acquisition um, in Alaska and also the, uh, the more recent one, the um, acquisition of 50% of the super pit of Kalgoorlie. And then just um, share some of the key observations and, um, and you know, lessons that we've observed uh, from the Northern Star um, growth story. So just to start off um, an in introduction, um, the, the first thing to recognise that is that although we're all geologists at heart and we love the rocks, um, mining and exploration of businesses and, and run that way. Um, and it's something to be very conscious of and it's something in the last five years in BD with Northern Star that I've become very aware of in that transition from being a true rock doctor into uh, understanding a bit more about the, um, the business um, side of the, uh, the mining companies. Um, and during MA, large teams are assembled to um, complete due diligence on technical projects and their, their technical and financial streams. And generally, the, the larger the acquisition, the bigger the emphasis on finance. Um, the due diligence forms the foundation of the valuation of an asset. Um, and that basically determines what you'll pay for it. And, and that's where a lot of the risk comes in, um, in terms of uh, reviewing M&A to see whether it's successful or unsuccessful. Um, it all comes down to valuation. Um, as with any part of the mining cycle, geology is a fundamental building block of, of anything, um, you know, in terms of the financial models that we use to assess um, that's underpinned by geology. One of the big things that you look for when you're doing M&A is the upside, and that is the um, understanding the intangibles and, and the exploration potential. And that's something you, that's very difficult to assess in a spreadsheet. It's something that's very difficult to assign uh, value to with any sense of um, certainty. And it's certainly something that's difficult to communicate with the accountants, um, but it's a critical part in, in seeing, um, you know, where a, a project will, will end up and how successful it will be. And look, the, the last point there, the quality of the due diligence um, determines the long-term success of the transaction, okay? And it's pretty hard to judge these transactions, um, you know, immediately. Uh, usually takes time to see how it works out. And I'll put a few disclaimers there. Um, in, in addition to the, the actual technical due diligence, there are a lot of external factors that, that control the success or otherwise of a, of a um, m and um, event, such as uh, commodity prices, FX, um, global pandemics, for example. Um, 
but it's really important to note that when you're actually doing due diligence, it's important to stress test um, the financial model and see what happens if the gold price drops, what happens if the uh, exchange rate changes, uh, you know, all those sort of things. The analogy I use with the m and that we've been doing um, is the iceberg. And what you see um, Northern Star's done in the last um, you know, 10 years or so, is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we do in our um, BD department and review projects. I'd say conservatively, we probably look at about 100 projects for every one that actually gets transacted on. Um, and we can't talk about them um, in terms of non-disclosure agreements. So all you see is the, uh, the, the successful transactions that have been made. So what I would say um, is when we look back um, without mentioning any details or any names, um, there's been a few, few fish that have got away that we've looked back in hindsight and said, oh man, I wish we had gone ahead with that project. Um, there's been a few that as we've watched the projects evolve that we said, oh geez, we've, we've dodged a torpedo on that one. Um, didn't quite play out the way we expected. So, um, you know, it, it's really important to, to review the projects that you've done and just see how they've progressed. Um, and it helps you fine tune, um, you know, the future m and that you become involved in. Um, the, the seagulls floating above, um, I refer to as the, the people that are involved in M&A that don't get a feed unless um, the transaction actually happens. And that's, that's your investment banks and, and a few of the, the financial, your advisors um, there. So you, you can see that, um, you, you know, a lot of these guys are pushing for a transaction to happen because they don't get paid if, uh, if you know, nothing um, completes. So you have to be wary of that because you, there's a lot of people that are pushing agendas that um, may not necessarily reflect the best outcome for the company. And look, it's important to note that when you're actually doing um, the m and in the mining space, um, there's different stage projects that you look at. So the exploration phase, the development phase, and then the producing assets. And the quality of that determines whether you're going to get around that iceberg or you're going to come into problems and, uh, and, and sink it. Um, the other thing from a geological point of view from the, the due diligence um, aspects is it's important to note that there's different um, emphasis based on different um, stage of project that you're looking to acquire. Um, so you can see there obviously early stage projects you need more of a, a regional exploration bent and then in the producing assets it's more around the, the resource and the, um, the brownfields exploration if you like. So just to um, summarize in a single slide, the Northern Star growth story, um, it's been an amazing um, journey with Northern Star in the last um, 10 years. You can see when I look back at the share price uh, 10 years ago on the May, um, as at May 13, uh, Northern Star had a share price of six cents and a market capitalization of um, $10.5 million. So it was basically um, almost a shell company, if you like. Uh, fast forward 10 years to the 13th of May, 2020, um, the share price was $13.37 and the market cap had reached $9.74 billion. Um, I think Northern Star was actually rated the best performing stock on the ASX um, during the last decade um, from 2010 through to 2020. And it's interesting to follow the journey of, um, of acquisitions and how the company's grown. Um, so you can see the first um, producing acquisition was Paulson's all the way back in 2010. Um, then in 2014, um, which was when myself and Andrew Barker became involved with, with Northern Star, was when they acquired um, the, the Barrick assets, um, you know, in the Caldwell district and um, Plutonic. So you can see there a $25 million acquisition of Plutonic. Uh, $75 million acquisition of um, Barracks Kalgoorlie assets, which was the Kandana deposit and Kanana Bell, um, followed by um, the acquisition of Jundee from Newmont for $82.5 um, million. And that's what set the platform for the rapid growth of Northern Star. Um, October 2016, um, divested um, Plutonic again, um, and actually divested it for more than what we um, paid for it once all the milestone payments are taken into account. Uh, made bolt-on acquisition by acquiring the South Kalgoorlie assets um, from West Gold. And then um, probably one of the, the most significant milestones in Northern Star's um, recent history was um, when we acquired the um, Pogo mine in Alaska from Sumitomo for $347 million. And this represented the first step offshore for Northern Star, um, one of our first steps outside of um, Western Australia. And of our mid-cap peers, it was probably the first one to, to actually um, step offshore and um, test the waters in, in North America. And I'll go through um, a, a bit of that 
rationale behind that transaction shortly. Um, then the, the big one um, that we've been working on for many years um, finally came to fruition and we managed to get hold of 50% uh, of the super pit and uh, from Newmont and we're now in a joint venture there with, um, with Saracen Resources. For, um, so when you add up what Northern Star has spent on acquisitions, um, since um, 2010, uh, there's been about just over $2 billion spent on, on acquiring these assets. And it's created a company with a, a market capitalization of $9.7 billion. So you can see um, from that, that through sensible mergers and acquisitions, through um, counter-cyclical um, investment, it is possible to add significant value. And um, the summary statement that I put up there um, basically sums up um, how Northern Star has done it. And it's grown through a combination of considered acquisitions, um, the implementation of operational improvements, and everyone will be aware that um, a lot of our executives have very strong mining backgrounds through uh, Barminko and, and um, working through various operations globally. And then the other key point is the heavy investment in organic growth. So drilling, growing by the drill bit. And that's where the geology particularly comes into um, its own during the due diligence. So in terms of what we look for um, when we're doing due diligence, um, this is a slide that I put together that um, sort of highlights where geology um, fits into the mining cycle, all the way from exploration through to, um, to development, resource definition and, and extraction. And we tailor our exploration um, and our due diligence to, to fit this, this model. And I find this diagram is really quite effective in terms of um, you know, troubleshooting issues when we, we buy new assets. Um, we've even used this to sort of form the basis for organizational restructures. We, we have to go through and look what geology is required to deliver at every stage of the process. And this is the framework under which we review um, the, the potential mergers and acquisitions. One of the things that we've learned um, over the years um, through all of the projects that we've looked at is it's very, very important to recognize the different um, geological skill sets that are involved there. And in fact, when we back analyze some of the, um, you know, in the industry where, um, you know, that, that things haven't quite gone as expected during um, an acquisition or, or, you know, once an acquisition's happened, a lot of it can be traced back in, in cases um, to using the wrong geological skill set to do the, um, the, the due diligence. So the way we look at it is we split it into exploration um, assets, development assets and production assets. And we recognize that, um, you know, Greenfield explorationists have a very um, specific skill set and they are the ones that we involve. Um, and that's the lens we look through the early stage assets with. For development assets and production assets, um, it, the value is driven a lot more by the, the resource model and what underpins the, um, the, the financial metrics, um, how much gold is in the ground, um, how we're likely to extract it, uh, the mineability of it. And then when we get into the, um, the assets that have um, been production assets, um, we um, look at it also through a, a production geology lens. And I think that's often um, underrated. Um, people tend to think of a geologist as being a geologist, but there are specific skill sets and specific lenses um, within the umbrella of, um, of the geologist group, if you like. And then the, the other key um, aspect for those more advanced projects is the brownfields exploration. So that's taking large detailed data sets and, and looking for potential upside. So thinking about um, what we look for during the geology due diligence, I've broken it down into nine key um, areas. Uh, one is the deposit model, like the mineralization style, the potential size scale and review of um, analogous deposits, what it could be. Um, the system and the size endowment uh, for, for the for known systems, the scale, the grade, the continuity, historic production. Um, early stage indicators, okay, what's there, the geophysics, some of the stuff that, um, that Mark was showing in his presentation, that you can clearly see that Sky have got some very good early stage indicators that can vector you into to mineralization. We look at that. Uh, the data, um, that's, that's a bugbearer of mine, the, the quantity and quality of data um, that's been collected to date and, and determine whether it's been adequately closed off and, and what we need to do there. Resources and reserves are a big one. Um, one thing after the, the 
hundreds and thousands of projects that we've looked at is the quality of resources and, and reserves is not consistent across the world. Um, even though we've got JORT codes and NI43101 codes, um, there is still a, a highly variable uh, quality in um, what is, is called JORT compliant resources and 43101 compliant resources. So we spend a lot of time rebuilding and remodeling. Um, the growth potential is a, a key thing. We will not buy an asset unless we can see a pathway forward um, to grow the, the business. Um, the geo mineability. So this is where the geometry and the geology factors um, come into play to see whether it's amenable to extraction or not. So the geometry, the consistency, the amount of um, structural disruption um, and any potential geometallurgical issues. Uh, the systems and the processes, we review very closely the, the systems and the processes of, of the um, existing operation because what that does is gives us confidence in, in the, the data that comes out of that. And then the other key part is looking at the risk to the plan, identify any fatal uh, geological flaws, um, look at the financial models um, and the, the geology related inputs to that, such as the grade, mine to mill reconciliation um, and any mitigation plans that we, we consider to, to rectify any issues. So just moving into some of the examples and I'm, I'm conscious of the time, um, there's a fair bit of detail in, in here and um, feel free to, to read this um, at, at your leisure. Um, but what I'd like to do is just give a rough um, introduction to what we were thinking with some of our um, recent acquisitions and the Pogo mine in North America um, is uh, one of the, the recent ones that has a huge future for Northern Star. And um, it's been a very good acquisition so far, um, yet the best part of the deposit is yet to come. Uh, I think that'll continue to perform well. And um, as our, uh, many, our executive chair said on numerous occasions, he expects this to eventually be our um, number one asset within the portfolio. So where is it? On a continental scale, we're um, located in the Northern part of the American, North American um, Cordillera and the accretion area belt that's on the margin of um, ancient Laurentia or the North American Craton and the Pacific Plate. So if we go into the, the um, provincial scale, it's in the Tintina Gold Province, which is a, a large um, arcuate zone defined by the, the Tintina Fault to the north and the Denali Fault to the south. And these faults are um, dextral offset and, and a significant major fault. Um, for example, the, um, the, the Tintina Fault has a displacement of about 450 kilometres on it. The Denali has a displacement of about 300 kilometres. They're both dextral. And even though the, the movements are at different rates, that's caused these link structures between the two major faults that um, have localised some of the mineralisation in, in the district um, scale. All right, so in a nutshell, um, POGO is an intrusion related gold system. You see, um, you know, the elemental associations, um, the, the bismuth, the tellurium and, and all the other bits and pieces and very close proximity to, to fertile intrusions. So it's a relatively young deposit compared to what a lot of us in Australia are used to dealing with. Um, so there's a series of mid-Cretaceous um, plutons that were emplaced um, in that central part of Alaska. Um, relating to the subduction and extension of the, um, the terrain collision and, and POGO is one of these. So when we were looking at it from a regional geology due diligence point of view, the jurisdiction was fantastic. Um, Alaska is open for business um, in terms of mining, very supportive um, and well-established mining um, framework. And, you know, that is one of the key things that we look at. Um, there's nothing worse than um, going to bed at night, not knowing whether you wake up and own your deposit, which has been the case uh, in some places such as PNG recently. Um, the deposit model, um, the early stage indicators, the growth potential, the belt scale endowment was there. And one of the other things we look at is the bolt-on opportunities in the district. So there are some, some pretty um, impressive projects in, in Alaska, and we're keeping a very close eye on, on them, obviously, from a BD point of view. On the local mine scale, um, once again, conscious of time, so um, I'll just briefly go over um, this. Basically, um, POGO is um, hosted in a series of stacked mesothermal quartz veins that are um, uh, overthrust, um, if you like, and the mineralization is dated at about 104 million years old. Um, the host rocks are, are um, a combination of uh, paranice and orthonice. So um, for those of you that remember the igneous petrology of paranice is a, a nice where the protolith was um, sediment and the orthonice was a protolith that was um, intrusion. 
um, and it was a fairly old um, remnants of, of um, sediment, uh, so anywhere between the, the Proterozoic through to the, uh, the Siluro-Devonian. Um, but the key point is that they're very proximal to these mid-Cretaceous um, granitoids. So the, the pogo veins themselves, um, they um, dip flat to moderately, anywhere between 25 to 45 degrees. They have a laminated to massive um, texture. Um, and one of the amazing things about this deposit was the grade that was mined um, up until we acquired it was averaged 13.6 grams per tonne, so very, very high grade. Um, vein widths vary, pinches and swells due to both structure and um, structural repetitions and pinching and swelling of the vein and it averages about three metres. And it's a relatively clean um, ore, so it's got a, a low to moderate sulphide content dominated by pyrite and arsenopyrite. Um, so just in terms of what we were looking at there, we saw the geomineability and one of the huge opportunities we saw was changing the mining method. It was um, previously um, cut and fill um, and paste fill. Uh, and what we've done is we've changed the mining method in most locations through to, to long hole open stoping. And that's where the talent of our mining guys have come into it because it is a flat dipping ore body, but they have managed to get the, um, the long hole open stoping to work. Just to give you an idea of the impact on the economics, the mining cost of the cut and fill was in the order of about $140 a tonne. The, um, the long hole open stoping is about $48 a tonne. So it has a massive impact on um, the economics. So we saw the ability to, to change that to increase the profitability. The growth potential in the place was enormous. Um, one of the reasons it was divested was because they were at the limits of drilling and the resources and the reserves were, were um, running out. But there was enough scout drilling to know that the system continued and there was no evidence that the deposit had been cut off. So we saw enormous growth potential there with investment in drilling, which is the organic growth. Um, we saw some issues with the way that they were calculating their resources, but we also saw that as an opportunity to improve. Um, the data, as I mentioned, was extremely lacking. Um, the systems and processes were very different to what we were used to um, operating with um, in Australia. And we spent a lot of time over there um, actually reinvigorating it and addressing some of those system issues. And we thought their plan was quite risky. So during the due diligence, the mitigation plans were in place to, to actually try and uh, overcome that. All right, so the next major acquisition, the, um, the $1.1 billion acquisition of 50% of the super pit. And as I mentioned, there's, I won't go into this geology in um, too much detail. I would expect that most of our Australian geologists on the line would have um, been reasonably familiar with the Golden Mile. But needless to say, it's one of the best um, systems that this country has um, seen. Um, the Boulder Lafroy shear complex, which is, is you know, stretches for quite a distance um, in the order of hundreds of kilometres, but just the section between um, Cambauda um, up to the Golden Mile and just north to Paddington has an endowment of over 100 million ounces of gold and obviously hosts notable deposits such as uh, Fimistons, Knives, HBJ, um, Paddington. Um, so it ticked all the boxes from a, a due diligence point of view. The jurisdiction um, doesn't get any better than um, WA. The deposit model is the type deposit model for that type of uh, system. The belt scale endowment was there. The early stage indicators are there. And one of the things that we would say about um, some of the previous owners is they haven't invested in the early stage pipeline. And I think um, in coming months when we actually put some color around um, the expiration um, targets that we have at that ground, you would be amazed at what is there in such a, uh, you know, a so-called mature, mature system. Um, there's synergies with our existing operations around Kalgoorlie, um, but there is a huge growth potential, which is one of the reasons we, we jumped into it and specifically huge underground growth potentials. And eventually we want to take the Golden Mile back underground um, and mine um, the, the loads um, and the extensions to the loads and the halos um, that have been left behind in the first couple of generations of mining. So once again, um, this dives into a bit of the mine scale um, geology for the Golden Mile. And um, there's two distinct styles of mineralization there. Um, if you want to be a little bit more technical, there's a few more than that. But if I was to sum it up simplistically, you've got Fimiston style, which is the dominant style on the Golden Mile, and then Mount Charlotte style. 
So the key difference between the two is that the Thymiston style, which is the earlier style of mineralization, um, more of a brittle, uh, sorry, more of a ductile brittle type arrangement. Um, and the mineralization is um, shear hosted, load hosted, um, basically silica sericite um, sulfide telluride gold loads um, that occur in four different orientations. The Charlotte style mineralization, which is later, um, is more of a brittle um, stockwork array of veins. And you can see pictures there and um, some schematic diagrams um, that demonstrate um, Charlotte. So it's a bulk mining sort of uh, operation. Um, the key um, aspect of this was the historic endowment is amazing. So um, production from the Golden Mile and the Fimiston style loads was 62 million ounces between 93, 1893 and October 2019. And if you added our reserves to that and resources, the endowment 73 million ounces. And Charlotte, even though it's great in its own right, pales into insignificance at only 6.1 million ounces. So the, the gold, Greater Golden Mile has combined endowment of nearly 80 million ounces, which is amazing. Um, I'll let you read the rest of that at your leisure because we are running um, short of time. Um, but the next slide shows you a little bit more detail about the, um, the geology. Now, um, there's a couple of things to note here. Um, on the far left of the page is a plan view of the Golden Mile geology at, um, and our current interpretation at the negative 250 RL. And this, the predominant host of it is the Golden Mile Dolerite, which is a layered um, mafic intrusion. If you remember back to the um, old Bowen's reaction series, um, quartz is one of the last um, minerals to uh, solidify. Um, and historically, um, what they call Unit 8 Golden Mile Dolerite, which is the graniferic zone, um, is viewed as the most prospective host. What that image shows also is that it's not the only host. And, um, it is more of a structurally controlled system. Uh, for the Fimiston style mineralization, you get these loads um, in every single rock type and it's more structural dependent there. So you can see in that particular uh, image, most of the mineralization was hosted in unit nine, um, which is, has a slightly different mineralogical um, composition. Um, what we saw from the um, due diligence scale um, or mine scale due diligence was significant growth potential, not just from the underground at Charlotte and Thimiston. Uh, we saw potential opportunities with the pit and it's been great to have Saracen on board um, with that, um, given their strong open pit background, they've identified some fantastic opportunities there. Um, but there's also satellite deposits in the district that um, have a huge amount of potential um, once we get the ability to um, go out there and explore them. Good geomine ability. When we reviewed the data, there's some issues with the data and the amount of data collect. Um, we, the resource was okay, um, but still needed a little bit of work. And the systems and processes um, need um, refreshing, if you like. Um, a lot of the mine geology processes, for example, hadn't um, really evolved um, gee, since I was there in 2006. It was very similar processes still in place. So we, we saw a huge opportunity there to um, extend the golden mile. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say keep um, your eyes peeled for some ASX releases. And we will be releasing some color on the exploration potential um, within the next um, six months or so. And um, yeah, people will be amazed at what um, has been, um, you know, lurking in, under Kalgoorlie, um, you know, and hasn't seen the light of day in public. So just to summarize, um, the general observations that I would make um, based on what I've seen during the last five years in BD at Northern Star um, is that every asset has its right sized owner. So even though Northern Star has done really well out of these assets that the, um, the majors have divested, it's not a reflection on them. Um, it's probably more of a reflection on um, their portfolios and how strong they are. And every company, both major and junior, should be looking to optimize its portfolio. So I think, um, you know, a classic example would be the super pit, for example, it accounted for 3% um, of Newmont's production, yet it accounts for 25% of Northern Star's production. So if you think about the love and attention and the allocation of capital for exploration, um, it's gonna get a lot more attention in Northern Star's portfolio, um, and it's an even greater part of Saracen's portfolio. So the asset will get the attention that it deserves. Um, you need a strong strategic direction and a macro market understanding. A lot of the great work that um, Bill and the team have done um, has been counter-cyclical. 
um, and comes from a strong um, understanding of, of the greater financial markets. Um, discipline must be maintained. Um, you've got to back the valuation of the uh, derived during the, the due diligence. And, and one of the things that I've learned very clearly um, is that sometimes you, you, your company is defined by the transactions that you don't do rather than the transactions that you do do, um, which is a key point to keep in mind. You don't get up on stage and accept awards at diggers and dealers for not doing a transaction, but walking away at the right price um, can sometimes be to the benefit of your company long term and that will never see the light of day. Look beyond the spreadsheet. Um, what I find is a lot of um, people that, that are involved in M&A don't have a very strong technical background. Um, and once a number's in a spreadsheet, it is fact. Um, and you've got to look beyond that and, and really validate and test the, um, the ideas and principles behind it. The other point I would make is that if everything was running smoothly, um, the asset would be unlikely to be divested. So um, a lot of the reasons that the, um, the assets were divested was that uh, it had reached some sort of trigger point where it no longer fitted the portfolio, the reserves weren't high enough, the costs were too high. So when we take on a lot of these assets from the majors, we, we understand that they are challenged and we have to go through and, and um, implement changes to get them firing again. And uh, we plan ahead, so don't just assess the, um, the as is, but plan the 2B. So the key geological observations, just that geology is the fundamental building block of the financial metrics and don't let any engineer tell you otherwise. Um, it all comes back to the geology, uh, the, the drill data, the interpretation, the mineability, the, the resource model, the tons and grade that you produce is all dictated by uh, geology. Um, the other thing to recognize is there's specific geos geological skill sets are uh, required to adequately assess projects within the, the greater geological umbrella and sometimes a, a greenfields explorationist isn't the best person to assess a an operating deposit so you need to um, have a great um, grasp and a different lens to look through across the spectrum of the mining cycle um, the key point in due diligence is to digest the data set that you have and focus on the areas that go to value um, some of the uh, data sets that we've received have been um, you know, you know, gigabytes after gigabytes of data. Um, and in the timeframes that you have to assess, you've just got to get quickly into the things that go to value. And then um, finally, uh, form your own geological view um, and independent of biases. And from what I mean by that is quite often you get into an operation and the, the previous thoughts are the facts. So, and this is a fact that across geology, in my opinion, that quite often um, people's opinions and interpretations morph into fact over time. And we've seen examples of that at the Golden Mile, where Unit 8 is the, the only host. Um, we've seen it in exploration around the Archean, where you've got to look for the Mafic stratigraphy. Um, and that's people, opinions, and interpretations morph into fact. And that is not necessarily the case. So look guys, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, gone a little bit over time and apologies for that, but um, thank you for, um, for listening and uh, happy to take any questions. You've been flooded with thank yous and <laughs> so I think everyone got a lot out of your presentation just now. So yeah, I, there's, it's endless. What's coming through to me right now is so many thanks. Everyone's got a lot from it. So thank <laughs> you much, Lee. I have had one question that's come through. Um, while anti-cyclical acquisitions are favoured in times of extended elevated gold price like currently, how do the evaluations change? Is it worthwhile waiting until the next down cycle instead of overpaying? One, one thing that I've learned is that it's very, very hard to predict the market and predict cycles. And um, it's a typical case of when you're in a, uh, a boom, you think it's never going to end. And then when you're in a downturn, you never think it's going to end, but it always does. And the only thing that that, that changes is when the picking the peaks and troughs. And then you have things like COVID chucked in there that no one saw coming that really impacts the ability to, to, to raise money. So I think you've got to um, find value in whatever current market that you're, you're dealing with. And you'll, you'll notice if you look back at that chart of Northern Star acquisitions, they've got more and more expensive as we go along and as we, we've grown, but the value is still there. And, and I think you can find value if you do good due diligence and smart acquisitions in any market. Um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily wait until the next bottom because we don't know when that's going to be. Yep. I haven't seen any other questions, but we are heading into the happy hour now. So everyone's welcome to go back off mute, turn your cameras on, have a mingle. There's a great crowd here, but 
Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Mark. I really enjoyed that session. I hope everyone else did as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to everybody for joining and happy weekend. Thank you. Enjoy.